The road to the resurrection starts when Jesus asks the disciples a question. And the question was, who do people say I am? And when Peter got the right answer up in Caesarea Philippi, then it says that from that time on, Jesus began to tell them this new, the, the pre-existing eternal plan that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer and die and rise again. When Peter said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, Jesus realized they're getting a download from heaven, they're equipped, the church is beginning to be birthed, hearing from God and acting upon it, and from that point on, he turned his face toward Jerusalem. He, he turned his journey, which had been traipsing all over Judea, Samaria, Galilee, other regions, it's now going towards Jerusalem. Now last week we said he did make one detour, one detour before he heads south Jordan, Jordan Valley, and the detour was Mount Hermon, I believe, uh, the Mount of Transfiguration. Some people might think that it's Mount uh, Tabor, but if you look at a picture of, uh, of, of the map, we can see Mount Hermon is in the upper northeast part of Israel, up in these, this mountain, and it's very close to Caesarea Philippi, where he, he asked the question, who do people say I am? And the reason he went there is for one thing. He met with Elijah and Moses. Now, the, the details of the meeting we don't fully know, but what we learned about last week is that the Gospel of Luke tells us that they spoke of things regarding his departure. So, figure it. Jesus has been walking around, collecting disciples, doing miracles, teaching about the kingdom, teaching about God's love for three years. He gets to Caesarea Philippi. He asks them, who do people say I am? They say, Peter says, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And they say, okay, now that you got that, I'll give you the plan. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer, die be buried, rise again. Then he goes to Mount Hermon. He meets with Elijah and Moses. He's transfigured, and they, he speaks about his departure. And then he starts down the Jordan Valley. Now, if you look at the other map, the, the, uh, where we, we're about to go to is Capernaum. That's the first stop southward that he goes to. And as you, the weeks go by, we're going to go all the way down that Jordan River and then make a right turn at Jericho and go west into Jerusalem probably in about a month or so. But what happened in Capernaum? What was so important about Capernaum that Jesus needed to make a stop and do some profound teaching there? Let me tell you a little bit about Capernaum first before we get into what happened there. Now, Capernaum is situated on the, the northwest shores of Galilee. Some say the northwest corner of Galilee, but Galilee is like an oval. It doesn't have corners. So if it was like an oval oblong clock, it would be where the 11 is, basically. And that's where Capernaum is. It's an important city. It's named Kafir Nehem, meaning village of Nehem. And an ancient person named Nehem lived there. You know that because when you go there, I've been there many times, there's a pillar with the name Nehem upon it. It's not the Nehem that's uh, the Old Testament prophet, but it's someone named Nehem, and it's Kafir Nehem. And it's Kafir Nehem in, in the way we pronounce it. It's a fishing village, and it's a, it's a fishing village that's a ho home of some famous fishermen. Who were the famous fishermen? Peter and his brother Andrew, James and John, and very possibly Matthew. They called him Levi, the tax collector, but they all lived there. Five of the twelve lived in this little village. Now, this is the city that Jesus moved to when he got kicked out of Nazareth. He got, he, you know, he's from Nazareth. Jesus is Jesus of Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem, but he, his hometown, he grew up in Nazareth. And at one point, he, in Luke chapter 4, he reads the scriptures in, the, in the, the synagogue. He was asked to read the scroll, and he read Isaiah. And when he started to interpret the Isaiah scripture, he let on that Gentiles were able to come into this, what was the chosen people's exclusive faith. And once they realized that he's letting Gentiles in the door, they took him to a high hill, and they wanted to throw him off, kill him, throw him off a cliff. And Jesus what did not allow that to happen, because if he did, well, he would have died for our sins, I guess, there. <laughs> and instead of like a cross, it'd be like a big cliff in the back, or we'd have cliffs around our neck. I don't know what, but if that wasn't to be, Jesus passed through the crowd. I don't know if he packed his things or not, but he moved. He moved to Capernaum. So this became his second hometown, and that's why he was called a Galilean by such. But he was a, a Galilean because he lived in Capernaum, and he ministered a lot around Capernaum, did a lot of miracles there. A lot of the miracles that you see in the Gospels took place, including some famous ones, um, some healings, and, and like the one where, where they lower the man 
through the roof on a pallet because it was so crowded. Imagine having a Bible study that's so crowded. People are packed in every room and packed out the door that if someone wanted to reach you, they had to kind of rip a hole in your roof. And, <laughs> and that's what they did. Jesus healed that man. He also healed um, Peter's mother-in-law in Capernaum. And if you look at the site of Capernaum, if you look at this uh, aerial picture of modern-day Capernaum, this is what it really does look like now. Um, it's not what it looked like then, but they, they kind of uh, restored a lot of the foundations of the neighborhood houses. Um, give me a close-up of that, if you would, Jaden. So if you look at what we're seeing here, on the left there is foundations of little insulas, little houses from the first century. Now that big octagon is a church. It's called the, the Church of St. Peter. And what it is, it's um, suspended. It's a church of the Pilgrim of St. Peter, and it's suspended on these flying buttresses over one particular of those little squared off rectangular little foundations. Why the one? Because there's one of those, and when you look at it, it's nondescript. It's not any more special than the others. But this one has been around since the first century. But during the first century, when those followers of Jesus went back after the Romans conquered Galilee in the Roman War, they went back and they looked to all these places in Galilee, places in Capernaum, and they saw a bunch of these little foundations. And they're looking through it, and they came to one. And, it, and one of them had very ancient, but very profound and pronounced graffiti all over the walls. Not all of them did. And the, the graffiti on this one would say things like, Jesus, we miss you. Come back, Jesus. Maranatha, return to us. Jesus, we love you. Know, all over these walls. So the first century saints made their way back to the house in Capernaum that Peter's mother-in-law presumably owned, Peter lived in, and Jesus was the house guest of. And so it's really an interesting spot. Um, you know, there's a great joke about Peter uh, regarding his mother-in-law. Do you want to hear this? Not many of you do. So let's just move on to the... <laughs> All right, so they asked Peter, you know, after he denied Christ, he's like, you know, his disciples get with him, and Jesus forgives him, and they're talking to him. I said, bro, you know, how could you deny him? Like, he was your best friend. He's our, he's our Lord. He did so much for us. How could you deny him? And he told people you didn't even know him. And Peter's like, well, you know, at the time I was a little mad at him because he healed my mother-in-law back in Capernaum, all right? <laughs> Let's get into the scripture. Matthew 17, verses 24 through 27 says this. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, that's the setting, the, uh, the collections, I'll read from the, the collections of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter, the collectors, these are like temple tax collectors, different than Roman tax collectors, temple tax collectors. Doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? Yes. From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that we may not cause offense, go and take, go to the lake and throw a line and take that first fish that you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and for yours. And so what, what, what's, what's happening here is there, there's collectors of the temple tax. Now these are Jewish people that are somehow attached to the Jerusalem temple, and they're collecting a, an annual tax, two drachma per person, usually probably two drachma per man. And this is a, a tax that's in addition to the Roman tax. It's addition to tithing. It's another way that money is being somewhat extorted. And what, what Jesus is saying is that, hey, the temple is my father's house. And do fathers tax their children for living in their own house? Or do rulers, when they, when they attack a country and they, you know, they acquire a country, do they make their children pay the same tax as those that are subservient to them? And so Jesus made a point that he didn't have to pay this tax, but he did pay it. He did it not to cause offense to those that were collecting the tax. And listen, folks, this is a lesson. We do need to pay our taxes, right? <laughs> Allie and I had a very tough tax year last year. It was, it was kind of tempting because we sold you know, a property that we had uh, for, for rent, and it was 
get more difficult to rent in Nashville, and we decided to sell it, made a little money, and the government came after us and they wanted it, so we had to give it to them. But what Jesus is saying is that, the, that as, we, as we are obedient to pay our bills, pay our taxes, God will provide if we trust him. And this way, God provided in a really crazy, peculiar manner. How did he do it? Can you imagine? Jesus says to Peter, yeah, we're going to pay the taxes. Go down to the lake uh, and then cast your line. And then the first fish that you catch, take four drachma out of his mouth. Take the coin out of it and pay. And Peter's probably looking at him like, what? I'm the fisherman, you know. I've fished this lake, you know, since I was a little boy. You're telling me I'm going to get a fish with a coin? But he knew Jesus by then. And Jesus did weird things. He did weird things to freak him out. You know, he, he like I talked about last week, I mean, when he and he saw somebody blind and he, and he decided to, to put some spit and some mud and smush it together and make schmutz and put it in the guy's eye and he'd be healed. Now, could he have done it without the schmutz? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but he likes to throw us off that it's not a method, it's about obedience. And Peter, by obedience, had to go to this very familiar fishing hole throw his line in, pull out a fish, like thousands of fish that he's caught before, and in its mouth, miraculously, was the coins, the two drachma, the four drachma coins, two for each guy. So what do we learn from this? Why the coin miracle? Well, four things. Anything can happen. Guys, never limit God. Never say it's impossible. Anything can, be ha can happen, even miracles. Second is never limit God. And, and what I mean by that is that God can do anything he wants to do. It's up to him to set parameters. It's up to him to set limits, not us. Never limit God. The third one is that he will provide. Never doubt. Always trust. Always be obedient, if, even if he tells you to do something weird. You know, it'll never defy scripture. It'll never go against scripture, but sometimes it'll step out of the comfort zone. Be obedient. And the final one is to trust him like a child. Trust him like a child, which is the, really the theme of what we're about to get into. And can you imagine Peter's elation when he caught that fish? I mean, he may have gone down there with a little bit of skepticism. Maybe like an adult fisherman just looking around saying, I hope nobody watches me you know, trying to catch a fish to pay my taxes. And he probably caught the fish and he probably... <laughs> He probably laughed. Can you imagine the exhilaration of finding the fish and getting the coin out of his mouth, just like Jesus said? He probably ran back and said, I got it, I got it. Can you imagine that? Like a child. And sometimes Jesus puts us in a position where we have to trust him like a child trusts its parents. I remember when I was a kid, I would go to a, my, our family physician, our family general practitioner, and uh, you know, he would do like, like, tricks to keep our attention. And one of them is to pull a nickel out of my ear. You know, so he would reach down and with his fingers and you know, rub my ear and boom, lo and behold, a nickel. And he'd give it to me and I'd be so thrilled, you know. I'd go home with my nickel, I'd show all my brothers and sisters. Then later at night I'd be like pounding, you know, <laughs> trying to get more out of it. <laughs> you know what it is? It's, it's this understanding that, that anything can happen. And, and we kind of lose that as we get older. Now I know my doctor was fooling me because there was no nickels in my head. Because, you know, I, I, I put the nickel back in to see if it would come out, and five pennies came out the other side. So I, <laughs> no, that didn't happen. Scratch that. So let's talk about what Jesus, what Jesus mentions just after the fish miracle. It's the next verse, but it's the, it's the first verse of the next chapter. The next verse says this. Matthew 18, 1 through 4 says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him, and he placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You want to know something? Jesus loved children. He loved children. He loved to hang out with children. He's always mindful and thoughtful of children. And, and in, I think he saw in them many things that he wants to impart in us. You know, I, I think that children are very special. Think about when you were a child and, and what your day was like, what your, you know, your weekend was like, what your summer was like, the first summer day of your school. And to think about the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, uh, the wonder and the optimism 
and this special feeling of anything can happen. And you want to know something? God wants us to have that for him and his kingdom. And think about what your perception was about Jesus, if you had any thought about Jesus. We were rehearsing the other night at Rocco's basement in, in uh, Keepwork, and, and he has on the wall a painting that he required, uh, acquired from somewhere. I don't know if he stole it or what, but... Uh, <laughs> and I took a, a picture of it. And Jane, can we just... And look at this picture. This really shows Jesus' heart for children. And look at the, the face of, of the children, particularly the one on his lap there on the left. Secure, loved, knowing that Jesus is, it cares about you and you're not afraid of anything. See, I, I believe that, that Jesus wants us to be like children and to have that posture of heart. Why? Because children are very special people. You know, their perception of the world is very pure and uncontaminated at first, and it gets there later. <laughs> But, but children are usually in, in, very different from us in these ways. They're very trusted, and we tend to be cynical. They're very optimistic, and we often are skeptical. They naturally want to play. Like, what do you want to do? Let's play. And we usually just want to work or relax. And we work so that we can relax and we go back to work again. <laughs> they openly express themselves. They're always singing and dancing. They do art. And what do we do? We tend to shun those things or downplay those things. And as we get older, it's just more practical things. What do you want to do today? I'm going to take out the garbage and trim the hedges. That's where I get my satisfaction. <laughs> you know, they have a ready sense of wonder. They're always ready for something wonderful to happen, but we tend to lose that along the way. They remain hopeful of what they will be when they grow up, and many adults have grown up and given up. You know, you ask a kid what you want to be when you grow up. A spaceman, a cowboy. You know, a princess, you know. I want to, you know, be a scientist and get rid of all the pollution on the whole planet. That was my daughter, Abby. <laughs> and when you grow up, after you grow up, it's like, what do you want to do? I just retire somewhere warm. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and what does God want you to do? See, God's not finished with you yet. And so we have to have this optimism of what it will be like for children. They love animals. They love stories, they love games, they love to swim in pools, they love playgrounds and coloring. Right? They love to pretend and, and to play outside. And we tend to lose appreciation for these things as the years go by more and more. The other day it snowed, right? Sometimes when you're a kid and your snow is like fantastic. When you're an adult, it's like, oh boy. And the kids, I have two, two, two 11 year olds, they wanted to go out sleigh riding, you know, saucer riding on the little snow saucers. I was like, oh, I knew they were asking me that. <laughs> It's freezing, it's not even nice fluffy snow, it's like, it's like snow with a little rain in it, so it's really wet and cold, and, but it's slippery, and they are having a great time. And so we go in the hill behind our house, and they're sliding down, and up and down, and falling off, laughing, and their hats fall off, and their hair is now all wet, and their faces are bright red, they're laughing, they're having a great time, and I'm over there, oh, I can't wait to go home, I wanna go back in the house, I'm shivering, I'm cold, I wish I'd get tired and stop. <laughs> You know, and I looked at them, and they were just having a great time in God's creation. And old dad was like, I can't wait to just sit down and have some hot chocolate and the cookies that mommy's making. <laughs> Jesus apparently loved these things about children. He loved to spend time with them. And the disciples didn't really recognize that. That's why in Luke 18, we just read Matthew 18, but Luke 18 says this, in Luke 18, 15 says, people were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. And when the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and he said, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such or people that are like these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom like a little child will never enter it. It's very similar to Matthew 18. What did Jesus mean? He said, Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so we have to think about what children are like. What did he mean? Children, kingdom, we, we, we receive it. And here's what, here's what they're like. In one sense, they're adventurous, they're silly, they're playful, they're trusting, they're optimistic. But in another sense, they're dependent, and they're teachable, and they're moldable, and they're subservient, particularly in that society. You know, children didn't have independent rights. They didn't have the right to sue their parents or anything. <laughs> that came later. 
they were subservient. They were supposed to, you know, speak when spoken to and do what they were told. But in that, they were very teachable, moldable, pliable. And they were very dependent. They wouldn't eat if the parents didn't provide food. And, you know, that's kind of the posture that God wants us to be in. Because he'll always provide. He'll always mold us. He'll always uh, take care of us. Jesus doesn't want us to be gullible. He doesn't want us to be immature. That's not what he wants. That's childlike. He wants to be, uh, I'm sorry, that's childish. He wants us to be childlike, teachable, submitted to his authority. Because he knew he was about to turn the authority of the church over to them. He was about to, to give them the keys of the kingdom, is what he mentioned in the very per first part of this, this journey, Road to the Resurrection, Caesarea Philippi, keys to the kingdom. I build my church, the gates of hell is not going to stand against you. He was about to depart and leave it all up to them. He wanted them to take control of it, to be the authorities in this church that he's building. And, and he didn't want them to be stubborn, arrogant, jaded adults. He wanted them to remain humble and teachable, like children. You understand this? There's a movie that I loved when I was a kid. I still love it. It's, it's uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Willy Wonka. You guys know this movie? And Willy, this story that goes like this. Basically, you know, Willy Wonka owns this great chocolate factory and making all kinds of crazy candies. And he's like this nuts guy, this crazy guy, but wonderful. He builds this giant factory, and he's got chocolate rivers in it, and, and everything's candy, and, and there are these Oompa Loompas that he got on some island. They're like, you know, guys that like walk around like this, Oompa Loompa Doompa Dee Doo. And they did all the candy making. And he realized he needed a successor. And he did this, he, he started a worldwide contest and all his millions of chocolate bars, if you found one that has a golden ticket inside, you can come to visit the secret candy factory for one day. And that's all it was told. And long story, but one poor young English boy finally got a ticket like all the other rich kids did. And he was one chosen to come along with six other kids or five other kids to tour the factory, the wonderful, mysterious factory of Willy Wonka. And little by little, each one of them broke the rules and disqualified themselves. And at the very end, Willy Wonka takes Charlie and his grandfather, father, Grandpa Joe, on a ride on the Wonka Veda, which is like an elevator that goes into the sky and flies around London. And during that time, he gets down to, to, to Charlie, and he tells him the very reason he was selected, the very reason that he was there. And this is what he says, I'll quote right from the movie. So who can I trust to run the factory when I leave and take care of the Oompa Loompas for me? Not a grown-up. A grown-up would want to do everything his way, not mine. That's why I decided a long time ago I had to find a child, a very honest, loving child, to whom I can tell all my most precious candy-making secrets. And that's what Jesus is looking for in us. That's why he says, you must be like a child to enter. You have to be like a child in the kingdom of God. Why? Teachable, humble, willing to receive from him. This is what he's looking for. And it's all summed up, you know, with, when, when he says, who's greatest? Jesus, he knew he was going to go to, to Jerusalem and die. He knew that they were all starting to position for power. You know, in fact, in Matthew 20, 20, there's this kind of a, uh, a, a very typical, if you don't mind me, fellow Mishpoka, Jewish mother <laughs> remark that came up from uh, the, the mother of James and John. And in Matthew 20, 20, uh, he, 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 the mother comes to Jesus. This is Jewish mother of James and John. says, I want you to promise me that my sons, they sit on your right and on your left when you're a king. And Jesus responds in Matthew 20, verse 23. He says, the places at my right side and my left side are not mine to give. Whoever my father says will have those places. But if you look at 24, the other apostles start chiming in. Verse 24, then the other followers heard this. They were angry with the two brothers. And Jesus called them to him and he said, you know how the kings of the nations show their power to the people? Important leaders use their power over people? It must not be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great among you, let him care for you. Whoever wants to be first among you, let him be a servant. For the Son of Man came not to be cared for. He came to care for others. 
He came to give his life so that many would be bought by his blood and made free from the punishment of sin. You see, he was telling them, you want to come in like a, like a Pharisee. You want to come in like King Herod. I want you to come in like a child, humble, serving, subservient. Because the kingdom of God, folks, is led by servanthood and sacrifice, not selfishness and skepticism. If you're coming in wanting to be a leader because of your selfishness and your skepticism, there's no place for you. But when we come in as servants and willing to sacrifice, that's exactly what Jesus is looking for. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. You know, I, I was surfing through uh, social media recently. And I came across a post I want to talk to you about. But very rarely does a, just a, a paragraph of words impact me the way this did. And um, apparently it was written by a doctor who was uh, you know, doing surgery on a little girl who had a twin brother. Now, once again, I don't know the origin of this, but I want you to just read this slowly and think about it in light of what we just talked about, being like a child. This is what it means to be like a child, to be unselfish, to be loving the way Jesus wants us to love others. It's exactly what he was like in the passage that we met, where we just read in Matthew 20, verse 28. For the Son of Man came not to be cared for, he came to care for others. He came to give his life so many could be bought by his blood and made free from the punishment of sin. And this is the love of a father for his children. It's also the love for uh, children to their father as well. And even as we mature in Christ, let's be childlike. Not childish, but let's be childlike, like that little boy. Let's be open. Let's be teachable. Let's be willing. Let's be re receptive to what God has for us. Let's be in the way we live, the way we worship, the way we devote ourselves to God. Like, like a child will curl up in their father's lap. My girls are 11 years old, they still do it. I hope they always do. And we have a moment. That's what worship is, guys. Let's listen closely to his stories. I tell my kids stories because they're always asking me, tell me another story about when you were a little kid. I tell the same ones over and over. They want to hear the same ones over and over again. Well, we want to hear the story of Jesus' life over and over again. We want to hear the story of God and his people over and over again as we study his word. And then let's watch what he does and be just like him. You know, you, 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 guys, you have a son, or maybe your little son probably watched you shave, wanted to be just like you. Ladies, maybe your daughter watched when you did your hair, they wanted to try to do it. That's what kids are like. Let's be like that. Let's see how Jesus was. We want to be just like him. Let's see how God's heart is to the lost. Let's want to be just like him. This is what it means to be a child. Just like children are always learning and always growing, let's always learn, let's always grow, let's, let's have our eyes on what it will be like when we grow up. Because we're always growing. You know, it will soon be as he is. We don't know what we're going to be like fully, when, when everything's fully developed, fully revealed. Because we're in a growing process, so let's keep that in our hearts and our minds. And we're going to be just like him when we grow up. I want to read this last scripture and then I'm going to ask Allie to come in lead us in, uh, in, in the band, in a uh, song. But let's just take this scripture to heart. 1 John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now that we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is.